How free is online speech today? I'm Sanford Unger, director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University. On this series, Speaking Freely, we talk from time to time with thinkers in the free speech drama unfolding in America. Today, Emma Lanzo, director of the Free Expression Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology in Washington. Emma Jan, so maybe you have answers for a lot of the questions that people are posing about what's happening on the internet <laughs> and, and what's wrong with it. Uh, why do we seem unable to find a formula to adjust some of the problems that arise on the internet? So if we're thinking about sort of free speech problems or, or issues of problematic content. Um, I would say problematic content. You problematic know, what, content. What, what, what yeah. do people do about that? I think. Well, I think a big part of the challenge is that we don't always have agreement about what problematic content really means. Um, so one of the first questions you have to ask is, what kinds of speech do you think need to come down? What is the kind of material that a different platform should or could be targeting? Um, and then you have to look at, you know, how do they define that material. So if we're talking about something like hate speech, which under US law is likely protected by the Constitution, but is also can be very hurtful and damaging and can really disrupt having sort of civil political discourse. Um, and whether it's constitutionally the case or not, many people think, in, intuitively react and say, well, hate speech should not be protected by free speech, even though we think it is. Right, right. So that's that's a place where the kind of the strong case law coming out right. of the Supreme Court around what the First Amendment limits right. government censorship. Um, it's a, it's really a different issue when you're looking at private platforms like a Facebook or a YouTube who are creating content policies that apply to millions or even billions of people around the world. It's a it's a really different sort of. Um, experiment <laughs> that they're doing of how to kind of identify and define a policy that could really work across many, mm -hmm. many different contexts that they're working in. Um, but I think one of the key issues to, to think about for any sort of um, online content issue is the issue of scale. Um, we're talking about millions and billions of files, whether it's images or text posts or videos being uploaded to services every single day. Um, and there's just there's really no way to have a an actual person review all of that material before right. it goes live. <clears throat> so the chances are you're going to have a combination of automated automated moderation, you know, um, machine learning algorithms, something as simple as keyword filters involved in kind of screening material, um, and then you're really going to have to do a lot of post hoc review. You know, when somebody has noticed a post that seems to violate a company's terms or maybe is illegal, then bring people into the process to review it. But in the meantime, materials out there that people can Circulating see. Circulating around. And, yeah, and, and be shocked by, be upset by, um, or, you know, think is perfectly fine, and then suddenly it comes down because it's been caught up in a moderation procedure. So who decides? Uh, a lot of the uh, companies involved, the social media companies, mm -hmm. have said that they've increased their staff mm -hmm. dramatically yep. to yep. monitor content to try to find things like this. Mm -hmm. Probably pretty difficult to find these things. It can be, yes. So the kind of the current state of play for most of the the really big social media platforms, for example, um, involves using a mix of automation to try to identify easier things like spam or um, images of nudity can be relatively easy to identify, uh, but also employing. Um, 
in some cases, tens of thousands of content moderators who receive kind of the, the notifications that either an automated system or another user has flagged a piece of content and says. Tens of thousands? That's of the, content yeah, I moderators. think Facebook's announcement earlier this year was that they were going to uh, something like double the number of people working on kind of the safety and security issues uh, around content. So reviewing content defining the policies and um, and really kind of evaluating whether material violates their But policies. literally, Facebook employs or will employ or is thinking about employing tens of thousands of people. It conjures up in my mind uh, a room or a vast, of course they don't all work in the same room, they probably work at home. <laughs> but a vast number of people. Yeah, and there's some really interesting research going on right now about this sort of, um, you know, who are these moderators? Who are these people? Who are they? <laughs> and the, so, well, it, it depends, again, and it depends on the kind of platform, but for the biggest platforms, um, it seems like a lot of the work is done on kind of a contract basis. So rather than being a full employee of the, um, of the social media platform, uh, there are now companies that kind of specialize in being subcontractors for content moderation. Um, there's also uh, a lot of use of services like Mechanical Turk or Crowdflower, so sort of crowdsourcing platforms as a way to reach um, you know, people who are freelancing from their home um, to do content moderation. But it's, it's a really interesting area of looking at, you know, the way I think of it is when you're trying to put a global scale censorship system in place, you know, what does what does that practically actually require? And because people are so much better at evaluating the meaning of content than the machine machines. learning. Yeah, still as you know, with with as many advancements as there have been in machine learning, with as kind of exciting and dynamic as that field is, it's still so much easier for people to make a, a kind of a determination about does this really merit hate uh, count as hate speech or not. In one sense, that's a relief that nothing's been found that can substitute for the human brain mm -hmm. in figuring these things out. On the other hand, it makes it sound like an almost insuperable task. And as you say, censorship on a global scale mm -hmm. does not sound like a concept we want to embrace. Right, and that, that you know, you're seeing a little bit of my, my bias, my orientation to these issues where, uh, you know, I think one of the places where our public policy discussions are really kind of foundering right now is this, this sense that kind of perfect application of a platform's terms of service is the goal, right? Like if you think of how kind of laws or even societal norms around speech have operated in the course of human history, we haven't really ever had a situation where it was even possible to have perfect application of those rules. Um, you know, we have laws in the US against making a true threat against somebody, for example. Um, and there are prosecutions brought under those laws, but they are, you know, probably a tiny fraction of the number of actual communications that constitute a true threat. And there is a Supreme Court case not so long ago that right. said uh, somebody who had threatened his ex-wife online that no one, the prosecutors could not prove criminal intent. So. Right, so that was an interesting case because we were all hoping the Supreme Court would give a very clear answer about what exactly was the standard that merited right. um, issuing a true threat online and they sort of punted so that question. Clear. It's not so clear. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, we have, you know, some high profile cases that really, in the law, that really help define the boundaries of what is and is not legal to say. Um, but when we're looking at kind of moderating speech online, the instinct seems to be much more like there should be zero instances of threatening speech or zero instances of hate speech on the platform. And that, I think it's important to realize that that's just a very different way of trying to apply right. rules about speech than we've really experienced before. And so I think that points to all of the different kind of countervailing interests that come up when you think about um, applying standards to speech. You know, who, who gets silenced when you have a really broad-based approach to taking down all, every instance of the bad speech. And, and so it sounds to me as if society is confronted with a very difficult dilemma. Is it worth the risk that many people will be silenced who shouldn't be in order to silence a few, right. 
or some mm -hmm. who should be mm -hmm. or, or, who, right. or who we think should be. Right. And that's where, again, like kind of thinking about being in this really, this environment of experimentation, um, because on the other hand, you know, I've, I was talking about um, kind of the people who will be censored with really broad application of laws, but or or rules on a content platform. Um, but on the other hand, you know, you have the people who are chilled by a lack of moderation. Um, there are so many different kind of studies that show that women um, and people of color and you know different traditionally marginalized voices and speakers find it much less easy to participate in online discussions because of the harassment they face, because right. of, um, you know, because of hate speech, because of targeted threats. You know, we have had people say to us in the Free Speech Project mm -hmm. that they will not do interviews like the very one that you and I are conducting now because they are worried about trolls finding them yeah. and harassing them because of some remark they may have made in the interview. Right, and that, I mean, that chilling effect is really real. And I think it's important for, as we think about, you know, <laughs> what what ideal response to problematic content do we want a Facebook to take or a much smaller platform to take? You know, it's, I don't think there's one clear, easy answer. There are a lot of different kinds of interests and incentives at play, a lot of different kinds of speakers who benefit from, from different styles of moderation. Sure. Uh, a lot of people say that Europe has figured this out much better than the United States, that, that the European community and individual European nations have um, put in place a, a right to be forgotten or, or not to be remembered <laughs> and get things erased from the internet right. in Europe. Or at least uh, a right to be delisted from search <coughs> results. Yeah. Right, yep. right. Well, that, that sounds more modest, but that's probably <laughs> yeah. exactly what it is, a right yeah. to be delisted from search results. So is that a model that we should be aspiring to follow? So that is a really, a really complicated question, I think, because so the, the right to be delisted um, that is sort of in operation in Europe right now comes out of a case where um, a man, Mario Costeja Gonzalez, uh, had had some debts, you know, 17 or 18 years ago, I believe his home went into foreclosure, and Spanish law at the time required that that information be published in the newspaper. Um, years later, the newspaper puts their archives online, and this article about his previous financial trouble becomes one of the most popular, highest ranking search results when people look up his name on Google. Um, because he then subsequently brought a high, like a landmark court case on this, that that link of the you know his past issues to his his name is like never going away. There's just so right. much commentary about it now. Um, but ultimately, the um, Court of Justice of the European Union, one of the highest courts in Europe, um, decided that his privacy right to have information that was sort of no longer relevant to his public reputation. Um, to have that suppressed kind of trumped anybody else's rights to, you know, Google's right to return search results in the order that they think is appropriate. Um, and the court didn't really consider the rights of the newspaper to have their archives kind of freely available under mm -hmm. any search query or the rights of individuals to find out easily, you know, all of the information that might be out there. Um, so, so the way it stands in Europe today is that it's actually the search engines, Google and Bing, Microsoft search engine, um, and the Yahoo or Oath search engine. Um, the companies who run the search engines receive requests from people. Um, they've all developed different forms and, and kind of ways of evaluating these, um, and basically have to kind of play the role of a judge and say, you know, has this person made a reasonable claim to say this lawfully posted public information that's available you know, on a website that is open to the public um, is s irrelevant or no longer relevant or um, you know, otherwise kind of inappropriate to link to their name right now. Uh, and so it, for me, it's a, it's a really uh, tricky question because I, I un certainly understand the privacy interests. So he won have. his case. He won his case and, and set a standard across Europe that um, kind of everybody in Europe, um, European citizens, have this ability to tell a search engine, you know, this particular link, whether it's to an article or a web page or something, um, it contains 
outdated or irrelevant information but, about me, and but, you should you should not return this link when people search for my name. But they can't say, I want an unlisted existence. They can't say they, nothing. Right, right, right. Like, don't return anything right. ever if somebody queries my right. name. I think that my guess is the search engines would reject that kind of request, and right. probably a, a court would back them up on that. But there was an interesting case just recently in um, the United Kingdom uh, where there were two different um, people who I believe had been convicted of some kind of fraud um, in the past. And so they had each made requests to Google to say, please stop returning articles about this old fraud conviction when people search my name. Um, and that Google had rejected both cases saying, you know, it's really relevant, your business mm -hmm. people, it's really relevant that you were convicted for fraud even if it was 10, 15 years ago. That's you know, from their estimation, that's relevant to anybody who might be trying to find out information about you, you know, deciding to go into business with you in the future. Um, so Google rejected their claims. They took their claims to court, and the, the court in the UK had a split decision. They decided that one of the people had shown sufficient remorse and really seemed to have reformed himself, mm -hmm. and so Google should really delist any of the re you know references to um, to this past conviction because he he was really sorry but the other man w had not shown sufficient remorse and so Google should not um, you know should continue to keep the information about the conviction uh, in his um, in his search results and to me it's just such a great encapsulation of how kind of ludicrous it is to be expecting you know a tech company mm -hmm. to be making that level of determination about you know who merits what kind of very almost, precise reputational remedy almost requires a staff psychologist or something <laughs> right. to and a lot of like or a private investigator right, or right. I, I mean the sort of the looking at the role that governments around the world and particularly in Europe are asking these tech companies to play I think we should be really cautious about this because you know we've just come from you know, months and months of discussion about the role of different platforms in, say, the 2016 elections here in the U.S. Um, <coughs> the sort of the push in Europe to put even more power on the shoulders of, uh, like, power and responsibility, but ultimately kind of to play the role of judges in deciding right. what speech is lawful and what speech isn't lawful, I think that's a sort of further centralization of power to intermediaries who... To the tech companies. Yeah, to the tech companies. To social media. Yeah. Uh, is there a different American solution on the horizon? What, there's a piece of legislation referred to as SESTA, S-E-S-T-A. Mm -hmm. S -E -S -T -A. Mm -hmm. Uh, what would that do, and what is that? What is that about? So SESTA has been passed into law. Um, it was a, a big debate through the end of 2017 and beginning of 2018, um, and it is the. What does it stand for? It uh, Stop Enabling Sex Traffickers Act, um, and there is a companion bill in the House. Sounds um, like something nobody could be against. Right, <laughs> and that was and that was a big dynamic of the kind of the legislative right. process around the bill, where um, you know ultimately the kind of combined version of the House and the Senate draft passed with overwhelming support, overwhelming bipartisan support in both chambers, um, in part because who can vote against a bill that's about stopping sex trafficking? Right. Uh, but there were a number of folks in the civil liberties community and also um, in the tech industry pointing out that there were some serious flaws with these bills and the kind of the approach that they take. Um, one kind of underlying piece of the, the legal framework to understand is the um, a law called Section 230 of the Communications Act. This is a law that basically sets the kind of the legal framework where a content host or somebody else dealing with third party content, so think you know Twitter and Facebook, but also search engines, domain names, um, you know a web hosting provider if you're going to run your own website. All of those kinds of intermediaries have protections under Section 230 that mean they are not legally responsible for content authored by a third party. So if I were to, for some reason, to tweet something defamatory about you, you could sue me for having defamed you. But I couldn't sue the platform on which you had done. Right. You can't sue Twitter no. for like being the publisher of right. that defamation. Um, and and this law, it, it's it's hard to overstate its importance importance in the development of the internet in the US. It is the reason that we have social media. It is the reason that we have 
any sort of willingness of Section 230 is the Section reason. 230, yeah. Um, combined with, you know, the strong protections for free speech under right. the First Amendment, right. but, um, but it really is this foundational law uh, passed in, in 1996 um, that has led to all of these different uh, online services, websites, social media platforms um, that we all use today, because if any of those platforms could face potential lawsuits for hosting our speech, they're not going to do it, right? It's right. just it's just as simple as, right. um, you know, the the fact that a even successfully defending a lawsuit can still bankrupt a small sure. company. Um, so SESTA so, changes some of that. Um, SESTA changed it created um, two changes to the federal criminal code, uh, which were uh, it's still unclear exactly what the consequence of those the the changes to the the federal criminal law will be, but more importantly, it now enables um, state attorneys general and state prosecutors to bring cases against website operators under laws that kind of match the federal criminal mm -hmm. um, standards around sex trafficking and facilitation of prostitution. Um, so that really expands the universe of prosecutors who could uh, bring cases against websites under Section 230, you know, in its original form, um, the federal government has always been able to bring lawsuits, uh, criminal charges under federal criminal law against any kind of website operator for having, you know, engaged in a criminal conspiracy right. or otherwise kind of violated federal criminal law. Um, now we're going to see cases, I'm sure, come up under, you know, a variety of different state laws, and the question will be how well do those state laws match the federal standard? But you'll also just have many more prosecutors out there with the ability to, to bring cases. Um, there's also expanded ability for people to bring civil suits against websites looking for um, damages, uh, recovery of damages, for example, for victims of sex trafficking. But isn't the prevention or the the punishment of sex trafficking, which is so such a terrible concept, uh, isn't that so important that we ought to be willing to sacrifice some procedural difficulties or state-by-state state conflicts or yeah. whatever in order to accomplish a, a, a very well-recognized good? Yeah. So I think one of, <coughs> the, one of the big questions with SESTA and FOSTA as they passed is, one, whether they were necessary to do the kind of the stated goal of going after um, websites that host sex trafficking mm -hmm. ads, and two, whether they'll ac actually be effective at helping um, reduce or eliminate sex trafficking. So on the, the first point, um, you know, kind of just days before the, uh, the bill was actually signed into law, a federal grand jury investigation that had been underway for over a year in the state of Arizona against the website Backpage.com issued something like over 90 er, charges um, in finally indicting seven different executives um, of Backpage.com uh, under existing law, right? Like SESTA had passed and was going to the president's desk for signature, but was not actually law yet. So this, this back page indictment, you know, we'll see how it plays out in courts, we'll see kind of what it means, but it was not necessary to change the existing legal framework in order to bring the prosecutions right. against this website. So what you're saying is it makes Congress feel good, they're taking a, they're drawing a line in the sand, they're taking a position against sex trafficking, but it didn't really advance the Well, and so in this case, it doesn't seem like it was necessary to change the law at all, prosecutors found plenty of charges mm -hmm. to bring against um, the right. operators of that website. And then on the other hand, we've been hearing from a lot of people in the sex workers' rights community um, and you know people who are engaged in consensual sex work um, talking about how the effects of SESTA are going to be actually to make their lives much more dangerous, um, to really increase the risk that they face uh, by driving them off of websites, um, you know, driving them either back onto the streets or underground to, uh, you know, to the dark web, to sites that are, right. um, you know, less kind of reputable sure. or, or safe for them to use. Um, and it's, you know, it's a really complicated question, right? So if, if this legislation is not a useful tool, mm -hmm. What are we to do? How do we fix this perceived problem of reputations being damaged, people being harmed? 
in some very concrete ways by things that take place right. on social media. And so for me, I think it's a, it's a mix of different strategies. Um, one, of, you know, one of the shortcomings of any national law that's trying to target some kind of bad speech is that the internet is a global network. And even so, in the case of SESTA, even if it results in no US-based company being willing to host any material, even an arm's length from sex, let alone sex trafficking, uh, websites will and already have started to just find hosting overseas. Mm -hmm. um, if you can find a web host anywhere in the world connected to the global network, people in the US can go to that website they won't notice really much of a difference at all from going to a website hosted in the US. Um, so you can have websites hosted entirely overseas that are facilitating person-to-person -person transactions here in the US that US government has you know, no jurisdiction over, that law enforcement may not be able to get to cooperate with investigations. So go, I mean, the, the kind of the fundamental issue with going after the online content aspect of crimes or other issues is you're playing whack-a-mole. That content is going to come up somewhere else on the internet, almost certainly. Um, so I think f as far as kind of criminal enforcement goes, um, focusing on the kind of the actual perpetrators of the issue, focus on sex traffickers, focus on people who are the actual people who are issuing threats against people or are conducting harassment campaigns against individuals. That is absolutely appropriate for law enforcement to do, and we probably need to see a lot more of it in a lot of different cases. Um, you know, it would be great for law enforcement to take issues of online harassment seriously and not just kind of right. dismiss it at, you know and, and that there are certainly many who do but you hear stories all the time of people reporting harassment to the police and saying it's like it's just social media get over it and it's like this person is talking about how they are going to you know track me down and kill me it's not you know it, this is really to the victim problem. it doesn't seem like a it doesn't mild. seem like a mild thing exactly um, and then the other component of it is you know there is a lot that the platforms themselves can do a lot that they already do but they have so much more leeway than government does as far as what kinds of speech that they um, restrict on their platforms, how they go about doing it, and again, you know, not to kind of keep coming back to this sense of experimentation, but we really are seeing and have seen over the past, you know, 15, 20 years, a lot of different ways of approaching the, the content moderation issue. And that's, I think, important to, to see keep going. Um, figuring out, you know, are there, what are the ways to um, moderate a community, a discussion to create a really healthy and vibrant community, whatever it may be talking about, whoever may be in it, um, and looking at like what are ways to construct platforms that discourage harassment or sort of reduce the potential for, for mobbing or um, you know, piling on of somebody. So we're really at a very early stage of figuring this out. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, it seems funny to say, given that we've had you know commercial internet in the U.S. for 20, 25 years. But I think what we keep seeing is, as more and more people come online, as the internet becomes more and more central to people's everyday life, we also see different kinds of issues come up, and different sorts of services that people are using, but also just sort of different expectations that people have of the platforms they use. So I think it is an area that is still very dynamic, is going to continue changing, um, and it's something where the more that people can understand kind of what their options are and what we say to kind of social media companies all the time is better communication with their users about what their policies are, um, you know, better kind of consistency in enforcement, and in particular the opportunity for people to let the companies know when something has gone wrong. Whether it's that you know we've seen horrible content, we think you you know you've missed something, you really need to take this down, or on the flip side, you know you've taken down my post, you've taken down my account, and I don't understand why I, you know, my commentary doesn't violate mm -hmm. your terms. Um, having some kind of appeals mechanism there is absolutely essential. One, for, for the person who's been censored, who's had their, their material taken down, but also for the companies to get input on, you know, where are their processes working and where aren't they? Where are they actually taking down, you know, a, a journalist's reporting on 
war crimes in Syria um, and not, you know, that might get taken down under uh, a policy they have against depictions of violence or, um, you know, promotion of terrorism. So it's really, um, there are no experts, there are no people to, to solve this problem. I mean, there, there are plenty of people who are working very hard on this issue, but I think it, it is important for us to realize that this is kind of a novel thing that we're looking to do in, in human societies. To ha you know, if you think of the job that Facebook is trying to do of creating a content policy that applies across a global user base of more than two billion people, when everything we know about how people communicate is that context is so important and what counts as harassment in one community right. does not you know counts as a really funny joke in another community um, where you know even the the concept of, of a slur or an insult to someone is right. highly dependent on you know the community cultural that you grew factors. up in cultural factors this is a this is an incredibly big challenge um, and let alone you know the idea that we everyone sort of sets their barometer of just how much speech do they want to see censored very differently. Emma, I'd like to be able to say thank you for making us all feel better about this, <laughs> but maybe I just have to be content that you've explained it to <laughs> us and given us a sense of just how enormous a, a problem this is. <coughs> just how enormous a problem this is, not only for the internet, but for free speech overall. Yeah. Well, if I can leave you with one one positive note, um, I am still at heart an optimist about the internet uh, because it does, at the end of the day, at least potentially empower people directly. And the idea that you there can be tools out there that p can help people shape, you know, what kind of online experiences they want, um, you know, the opportunity to use a diversity of different platforms. We don't all have to kind of expect a Facebook or a YouTube or a Twitter to be all things to all people for all information purposes, right? It's it's a big internet out there. There's lots of different options, and for I just I would encourage people to think what is the kind of experience that they really want to have, and where can they go and find that? And if they can't find that, is it something that they can kind of work to create themselves? Thank you very much. You. We've been talking and worrying with Emma Lanzo about the free speech rights of internet users and the moderation of online content. To learn more about Georgetown University's Free Speech Project, visit our website. Thanks for watching. I'm Sanford Unger.